Hey guys, it's Ruckus Gaming, and I'm coming at you with what I'm going to start calling Tuesday Tips and Tricks. I think my Tuesday uploads are going to start being a little bit more general knowledge and strategy type videos, and then my Saturday uploads will be the more fun playthroughs or challenge runs, ascension climbing, daily climbs, all that good stuff. Uh, before I get started with the tier list today, I want to just clarify a couple things. So, number one, first of all, is that this is not, strictly speaking, a most powerful relic list, which may seem a little counterintuitive, but this is just something that I feel about these relics, kind of a rough gauge of like, how big is the neuron activation when I see these relics come up in a reward. How awesome do I feel when I get these relics because I know how great they are? Or how meh do I feel <laughs> because the relics are not very exciting? And that can differ based on playstyle, favorite character, whatever. But I do think in general this is going to be fairly reasonable as far as judging if a relic is worth it or not, though you may have different ideas. And of course, you always got to say this, but in Slay the Spire, it always depends. You can get a top tier relic that is useless to you, and you could get an F tier relic that is actually the one little piece that you finally need to complete that puzzle. But we're looking at averages here. So without further ado, Let's get started and let's dive into this uncommon relic tier list. So first up, we're gonna have the blue candle, which lets you exhaust curses for the cost of one HP. And I'm gonna throw that right into C tier. Now, I think I said this in my last video, but generally speaking, you really don't want to have curses in your deck, which means that if you get this, you're not going to have curses most likely, so it's not going to offer a lot of great value. And it really doesn't even encourage you to take curses very much. Maybe if you're playing on Iron Clan and you have a lot of exhaust synergies, it might work really well. And maybe if the event is really, really good, but I can't see anyone really choosing to take a lot more curses just because they have blue candle extremely limited usability in my opinion next up we're gonna have bottled flame we have all three of the bottle relics coming up and this one is going straight into d i think the big problem with bottled flame is that most fights are not going to ask you to play a certain attack and even if you do have a really good attack card that you want to be playing often on the first turn unless you get really fortunate draw you're probably not gonna have any scaling to make that attack better and it's just not going to make the deck really pop off unless you have some really small super specific case like maybe you're trying to do a ironclad strength and whirlwind combo or you want to you know have a really big powerful card in your hand all the time but it's just usually not the case with attacks and this is one that you're often willing to skip or take the blue key, but even without the blue key, there are a lot of times I just leave this behind and I am much happier to draw the first five cards for my opening hand out of my deck than trying to ensure that I have one specific attack because a first turn attack probably just isn't going to make the most difference, especially as you get deeper and deeper into runs and enemies have more and more HP. The next relic we're gonna go is Bottled Lightning, and this is going to be our first S tier relic. I think personally, skills are the most valuable cards in the game in general. I think that skills 
do a lot of different things. You know, they can be blocks, they can be seek, they can be draw, they can be orbs, they can be attacks. They can be so many different things. The variance that you have within skills is huge. And often your skills are going to be what really make your deck work. The best ironclad decks still need skills. So the best watcher decks, you know, maybe not watcher, but you get what I'm saying. Almost all decks are still going to be very, very reliant on skills. So if you've got a great skill that can provide turn one scaling or something that just turns your deck on, like an offering or perhaps something like a blade dance for silent. Maybe that's not a great uh, example, but you see what I'm saying. Skills are very important and making sure you have a particular skill that really works to get your deck into its win condition faster on turn one is one of the best possible things you can have. Next up, we're going with Bottled Tornado, and that's going into the A deck, or A tier. I think, obviously, powers are very integral into your deck and provide the scaling necessary to make it through the later acts to beat the heart. But a lot of times, depending on what's going on in act, or turn one, that may not be the best time or the most useful time for you to start playing those powers. Sometimes you want to sit on powers and play them a little later. Or if you really need to block first turn, you're going to end up using all your energy to do the blocking. And you don't really need that power yet. So in general, I just feel like turn one powers are good. Don't get me wrong, but... Not as often as a turn one skill. All right, next we're gonna have the Dark Stone Periapt, and that's going straight into D tier. I think much in the same way as Blue Candle, that this really doesn't offer a great reward in exchange for a really bad penalty. You're not very interested in adding curses, and max HP is okay it's really not the best reward so this is just one of those relics that i see it and i'm like oh okay it doesn't even work with the ascender's bane because you've already picked it up before it doesn't work retroactively like a duvu doll which gives you just one strength for every curse you already have and will have later if you do decide to take them so in that way it doesn't even give a minimal bonus for the curse you already do have which is kind of frustrating. Uh, so that is one of the big reasons that I put Darkstone Periapt into the D tier. Next up is going to be Duality, and that's going straight to F. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I like to uh, try and force the Watcher Infinites too much. But in general, Watcher just doesn't really want to be blocking you're not going to be blocking very often unless you absolutely need to. And it just doesn't feel very fun. I mean, most of the time, if I do have this on Watcher, I'm kind of ignoring it and I'm just doing what I've already been doing anyway. It doesn't really change how I play. If I can use it, I might, but it just doesn't really seem like it affects how the Watcher works and adds a lot of value because she really doesn't want to be blocking unless absolutely necessary. And most of that is just getting into Calm anyway. So maybe not even necessarily the block is the most important part of playing that skill. Next up is Eternal Feather. This one's going right up top to S tier. I absolutely love when I see Eternal Feather because Instead of trying to make a bad thing better, like so many relics do, like curse relics, it just makes something good even better. You go to, you always want to go to campfires anyway because you want to be getting those upgrades. And if you can get a free heal 
and an upgrade at a campfire. That is just so, so valuable. If you're doing a double heal, that can take you from the edge of death to perhaps half HP or more, depending on how many cards in your deck. So I love getting Eternal Feather. Frees up more opportunities for upgrades. It rewards you for doing something you already want to be doing. And it can absolutely be a difference maker in providing the sustain or even just a one-time massive heal at a campfire that will get you off of life support and give you a cushion again so that you have the ability to play and absorb mistakes and bad draws and bad RNG from enemy attack patterns. All right, so the next relic we're going to talk about is the first of our eggs. This is the frozen egg. And that's going to go right up next to Bottled Tornado at the top of A tier. Obviously, I think powers are great. Upgraded powers are great. But if I'm trying to stick with the logic that I have with the Bottle Relics, I think I do have to put the Frozen Egg in the A tier. Because I still do think that skills are the most important subset of cards so a little hint on what you may be seeing a little bit later with some of the other eggs next up we have gremlin horn another s tier relic what i love about gremlin horn is that it gives you two things that you're always going to want it gives you more energy and it gives you more draw it rewards you for doing something you like to do, which is kill enemies. It simplifies a lot of decisions when you are fighting a multi-enemy combat and you are possibly trying to decide between two low HP enemies who to kill. When you have Gremlin Horn, doesn't matter. Kill them both, because as soon as you kill one, you're gonna have the energy and another card to go after the next one. So absolutely love to see this when it comes up next we have gold plated cables another s tier relic so this is our first character specific relic in the uncommon list and it's a really good one maybe i'm a little biased because this has helped me a lot recently i had a heart fight where i just parked a frost orb in that first slot it gave me that block to start each turn so I didn't have to worry about beat of death but even more than that it is just more of whatever you want whether you want more plasma orb for more energy whether you want more lightning orbs for more damage whether you want your darkness to grow even faster I think gold plated cables are a very strong relic and whenever I'm playing the defect I like seeing it because of the flexibility that it offers. It's not just, you know, plus one strength, or it's not just, oh, you get a one-time bonus here in this specific area, but it really allows you a lot of flexibility and you can tailor it to whatever kind of deck or play style you have. It's not going to necessarily win a run for you. It's not that big of a difference maker but it is something that offers quite a bit of support and it makes reaching whatever your ultimate goal with your win condition is much easier so very very solid s tier relic next up we have horn cleat i'm gonna throw this up here another a tier relic this one i believe it is 14 block on turn two i really like that a lot it is you know, nearly three base defense, so you can think of it almost as three energy worth of block. And there are a lot of big turn twos. So whenever you're in a combat and you're getting free block, it's great. Turn one, turn two, especially really, really good. And the amount that it gives you is quite significant. 14 block is nothing to sniff at. So 
One of those things where it's a passive, it's not something you use, use in an active way, but it is just such a solid benefit and turn twos do have some pretty nasty attacks going on, especially later in the run. So Horn Cleat, very solid relic in my opinion. Next up we have Ink Bottle. Now I'm gonna throw this as our first B tier relic. It does give you a reward, I guess you would call it, more draw for doing something you're just going to be doing naturally, which is playing cards. Every 10 cards, you get one more draw. And maybe this is a weakness in my own ability or play style, but I often feel like the cards are being drawn at very inopportune moments where maybe I have zero energy or not enough energy. Maybe you've got that ninth card and you're trying to decide whether or not to play it, but you often feel forced. Maybe you need that block to survive a turn. Maybe you want to kill an enemy with one more attack and you're just like, man, I really need to play this last card. It's going to give me Ink Bottle and it's not going to do anything for me. Maybe you guys are better than me at using this, but it's just a very mediocre relic. It can be really good if you work it carefully, but also sometimes it just kind of does its own thing and it's not something that you think very, very closely or carefully about because it's not going to be the relic that wins a run for you. It's just not. Next up we have Kunai. And I think this is going to be one of our first hot takes. I'm throwing Kunai in B. Now, before you go crazy, let me just explain. One of the reasons that I feel like this is an average relic at best is that it is kind of raising the floor instead of raising a ceiling by playing attacks to improve your dexterity and blocking. You are perhaps improving a weak end of your deck. Maybe you're very attack heavy, so you need the block and that added dexterity will make your fewer blocks do more, which is good. But I think if you're playing an attack heavy deck, you want to be attacking and you want to make the attacking better. Another little bit of foreshadowing for what may be coming later. Um, but with that being said, there also aren't very many kinds of decks that are necessarily going to be playing three attacks every turn especially not early in a run. It's really good on the silent. I'll give you that. If you're running a shiv deck on the silent, this is amazing. Even in fairly aggressive attack heavy decks, the silent still has a big interest in block and stalling out fights, letting your shivs scale up with accuracies, letting your poisons stack up. So on the silent, it is particularly good and you could make a very solid argument that it should be higher in the tier list, particularly for the silent. But I just feel like a lot of other characters are not going to get the most value out of it. The defect is going to really get most of its block from its orbs. The watcher doesn't really want to be blocking a lot. I think Ironclad will play the attacks and then not really care about the dexterity necessarily. So ends up being just kind of middle of the road for me. All right, next up is going to be Letter Opener. And I'm going to throw that right at the top of B tier. In a lot of ways, it's similar to Kunai. Play three skills and then get five damage to all enemies sounds quite similar in a lot of ways to kunai play three attacks get one dex i think it's good because of the aoe and getting multiple enemies at the same time is very nice i think there are quite a few numbers of decks for the silent and the defect that are going to be playing a huge amount of cards the silent discard decks the crazy defect skim energy decks where you play lots of 
skills in a single turn is going to reward you with quite a fair amount of damage. Now, on the Watcher, on Ironclad, maybe not so much, but still a very solid middle-of-the-road relic, depending on your deck. Could be amazing, or... Maybe it just gives you a little bit of damage here and there every once in a while, and it is what it is. Next up, we're going to go with Matryoshka, which is a C-tier relic. The biggest problem of Matryoshka is that it does not offer any immediate rewards. And if you have just beaten an elite, if you have gotten a nice chest at a unknown room, you're really looking for something good. And you get a Matryoshka and you're like, ah, well, it could be good later. When you think about it, it is essentially plus two relics. If you get that next treasure chest, that'll give you two relics. But if you had gotten an actual relic before and then one at that chest, that would be two. Now your second chest, you get those two relics, that's where that bonus comes in. So it's a very delayed bonus, and completely up to RNG, you know, whatever is on the seed, whatever is next in the list of the relics, you're going to see what it is, maybe it works for your deck, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it gives you Dead Branch, and you just win now. Or maybe it gives you Duality, <laughs> and you're like, oh, well, thanks Matryoshka. Very, very underwhelming, but in certain circumstances could be very powerful given that relics probably have the most weight as far as determining how successful runs can be. You know, the cards you take are obviously very important, but I feel like most runs are generally won off of the relics, the amount of relics you're able to build up. That's why we go for those elites. So, C tier. Could be great, usually just kind of eh. Next up, we're gonna throw Meat of the Bone into A tier. I love Meat on the Bone, providing bonus healing when you need it the most. You can go for some kind of deeper play strategies where you yo-yo kind of up and down. You allow enemies to do small bits of damage when you're around 50% health so that when the combat is over, you can get that 12 HP from meat on the bone. I think it's a great relic because I play ironclad a lot and it also gives healing on top of burning blood. But I think this is a great relic for any character and the sustain that it gives you over the course of a run is just so incredibly useful. Next up is Mercury Hourglass. That's going right into D tier. I think the three damage to all enemies is okay. It's something that really needs a long fight or multiple enemies to get a decent amount of use on. And as the run gets deeper into the spire, or higher into the spire, I guess, the amount of HP that enemies have are going to make the 3 HP, or the 3 damage that it deals, really insignificant. This is not something that is going to drastically alter a run, and it's just a little bit of bonus damage that's always there, and it's, it's better than nothing, but that's about all that you can say about Mercury Hourglass. Alright, next is going to be Molten Egg, the second of our upgrades, and that's going straight into C tier. So, with Molten Egg, obviously a lot of relics kind of depend on when you pick them up. The earlier you get Molten Egg, the better. Seeing upgraded attacks in Act 1 is absolutely amazing. And then, you know, it can be one of those things that you get in Act 3 and you're like, well, my deck's already finished for the most part, so I don't really need this. 
I'm not gonna take a lot more of attacks. You're probably more interested in taking skills or powers in Act 3. So it is something you wanna see early to get a lot of use out of. And it is really nice if you get it early. But apart from that, it's just, okay. I think attacks are probably one of the of the three subsets of cards, powers, skills, and attacks. I think attacks do end up to be the lowest on that list, with skills being number one, obviously, and then powers being in the middle. But there's nothing wrong with upgraded attacks. It just kind of depends on when you get it. Next up is Ninja Scroll. And I'm going to throw that at the bottom of D tier. I think even in Shiv decks, this is not that great. It will create situations where your hand is going to be full quite quickly, especially if you've got like a bag of prep as well as your Ring of the Snake. So turn one shivs are not really strong. You know, this is essentially just saying nine damage. This is the same as like a backstab. But if you get lucky and you get some accuracies on turn one, it's all right. Maybe you got a dead branch, so those turn one shivs can turn into something when you exhaust them. But generally speaking, even within a shiv deck, I don't really love seeing the ninja scroll and will often take a key or even skip depending on what's going on with my deck. Next up is Ornamental Fan. And that's going to the top of B tier. I feel like that might be another hot take that people might disagree with me on. In much the same way as some other relics I've said, I think it raises a floor instead of a ceiling. It provides you block to an attack deck. But I think that as far as raising the floor goes kinds of relics, it may be the best because those heavy, heavy attack decks do struggle to block and there are a lot of late game enemies that are going to require you to block. And this is a solid option for that, especially if you can be playing a large number of attacks per turn. Maybe you're playing a shiv deck on the silent. Maybe you're doing a claw deck on the defect. Maybe you've got an infinite watcher going and this is going to be your block option to deal with the heart or something of that nature. It's great on ironclad because ironclad is just always attacking and a little bit of block will help him just enough where the burning blood is going to be enough to also in combination do a fair amount of sustain over the course of a run. So out of all of the raise the floor relics, this has got to be at the top for me. So big fan of ornamental fan, no pun intended, but I think with my overall philosophy of raise the ceiling, not the floor, I have to put this in B tier with the caveat that it is really, really good. And it's never a bad thing. Next up, we have Pantograph, which provides 25 HP of heals before every boss. That's going straight to S tier. And I think it'll be even above the Eternal Feather. While you may get more healing out of the Eternal Feather over the course of a run, depending on the size of your deck and how many campfires you hit and all of that good stuff, the main number one draw of pantograph is for a20 and when you get those back-to-back -back bosses at the end of act three that's 50 hp of healing right there which is so so useful and valuable when you're playing on high ascension and you're trying to win a20 and you're trying to get to the heart it provides you the opportunity to upgrade at a campfire instead of resting before a boss. So I think that is always something that you want to be doing. And, you know, 
depending on the size of your deck and how many campfires, maybe Eternal Feather might do more, but this is always going to do what you need it to do at the most important time. Right before a boss, big heal. Next up we have Paper Crane, and I'm gonna throw that at the bottom of C tier. Now, admittedly, the Silent is probably my worst character. I think I have double the amount of hours on the Silent than I do Ironclad to get to three <laughs> ascension levels lower. A, the Ironclad is A20 for me, and I think I'm A17 with the Silent currently. So maybe I'm just not that great at the Silent, but I feel like the extra 15% weaken than it gives you is not that great. I think that the Silent is already really good at blocking, so it doesn't need a lot of extra help. Also, when you go through the Silent deck and you count only 5 out of 75 of the Silent cards actually apply weakened, and some of those cards are not great. So, it's going to encourage stalling and longer fights because you can handle it more easily. It'll allow you to scale up, but I think the longer a fight goes on, the higher the chance you have for bad RNG, the higher chance you have for making mistake, you know, messing up your card order when you're making a play, hitting the end turn button when you still have energy, just stupid stuff. Like, the main goal for me is to get out of combats as quickly as possible, or as few turns with as least damage taken. So, the Paper Crane, maybe I'm just not playing the Silent well, but it seems to me like it doesn't really help as much as you might want. Next up is Paper Frog, which I'm going to throw at the bottom of B tier. I think that the main difference between Paper Frog and Paper Crane is obviously that with the additional bonus damage taken to Vulnerable, you're going to be ending those fights quicker, which means less chance for bad RNG, less chance for a mistake. The biggest drawback is that when you look through the Ironclad deck, there are actually only four cards that apply Vulnerable. So if you haven't been taking uppercuts or thunderclaps, you're basically relying on the bash, which is great early game, but later in the run, bash is gonna be harder and harder to find within a bigger deck. So unless you've been really working and looking for vulnerability cards, then this may not offer a lot of value to you, but I do think most ironclad decks, even if it's just the bash, do really like having a paper frog just because it ends those combats quicker. Next up is the pair. F. It's 10 HP. That's it. I've said it a couple times. Max HP is not the most important thing in the world when it comes to Slay the Spire. Maybe there's an instance of you surviving with 10 HP or less, you know, I've had close calls with the heart, we all have, but in generally, generally speaking, max HP is not the number one factor to a successful run. So many other factors that will make your deck more powerful, more synergies with relics, it's just 10 HP, that's it, F. Next up we have Question Card, which gives you an additional card in the card reward, so you get to see four cards instead of three. I'm gonna throw that at the top of C tier. And the main reason is that the longer the run goes, the higher up the spire you get, the less value it will offer, because you're just not going to be wanting to add more cards. This is great early in a run when you're looking for cards. Maybe this is good in act two 
when you're searching for something, you know, you really want that corruption. Or you're really looking for more blade dances or accuracies. Or you really want to find a mental fortress or talk to the hand. Whatever it is, that one card that's really going to complete the deck that you're going for. Question card can help you get there. And then once it gets you there, it's kind of done. I mean, if it gets you that card quickly and turns your deck on really fast, it would be great. And you could say that this is, you know, essentially kind of like a run winning relic. You know, it helped you find a great set of cards and it helps you build a great deck. But that's still pretty RNG based. I've had this quite a few times and I've tried searching for cards and I've tried, you know, taking more combats than usual and still just never saw what I was looking for. I think you're better off looking for shops if you're trying to find a specific card and you're looking at perhaps more elites, but as far as the quality of it, it's very, very reliant on when you get it and whether or not you need cards. So could be great, couldn't be great depending on the situation and just eh that's how i feel about it eh maybe it'll help me out maybe it won't next up we have self-forming clay one of the ironclad exclusives offers you three block for each time you take damage over a turn i'm gonna put that straight into c tier i think it can be really good in some instances you know, if you get lucky with the heart attack and you get the, the multi-attack first before the big attack, absolutely great. Maybe against Book of Stabbing or some AoE fights like the bandits, you know, that attack you quite aggressively on almost every turn. It can be good, but it requires you to take damage first. So if you're already blocking, it's not going to offer a lot of value to you. If you only take one hit a turn, it's only going to give you three block, which is eh. It's just very dependent on what kind of combat you're facing. Not always going to be super useful, but that's just how I feel about it. Maybe I'm missing something. Let me know. Next up, we have Shuriken, which gives you one strength for every three attacks you play in a turn and this is going right up to a this is a very very strong relic i've said it so many times but raising the ceiling of your deck is what you want to be doing playing attacks to make your attacks stronger it just makes sense maybe that's very ironclad of me but that's just how i feel you should be leaning into what you do well and increasing your ability to do well at that thing. And that's exactly what Shuriken does. You've got an attack heavy deck. Playing attacks makes your attacks better. This is a run winner in a lot of instances, I think, as long as you have an attack heavy deck. Obviously, if you're doing like a discard deck with the silent, or you're doing uh, a weird skill power deck with the defect, sure not that useful but for me in my play style I tend to be pretty aggressive and I like playing attacks so I like this next up is singing bowl which gives you the option to take plus two max HP instead of a card or a skip at a card reward and I'm gonna throw that right in the middle of B tier I have said that Max HP is not the, you know, number one or even top half factor to winning a run. But on the flip side, being able to use multiple instances, this is going to get you potentially quite a bit more HP over a run than a pair. <laughs> Five card reward skips, that's very, very doable in a run. 
easily and quite often you could get more out of that if you get it early and you get a, a deck set up quickly. That is a lot of ifs, but I do think I like the idea of getting a reward for doing nothing in that, you know, you have a full deck or you're just not given very good rewards. You're going to skip it anyway and you get a little bonus for skipping. So that's nice. Getting a reward for doing something you're already doing, something that isn't adding value really, you know, not adding a card to your deck and making it worse is kind of adding value, but not really. So obviously depends when you get it and how good your deck is, how many cards you're going to skip, but you have the ability to really make good use of this and really pump up that HP. Next up we have Strike Dummy, which increases the damage to all of your cards that say Strike by plus three. I'm gonna throw that in D tier. It almost feels like an Iron Clued exclusive just because of how many Strike named cards Iron Clad has. I didn't really go through all the other characters in their decks and I'm sure that they have some other strikes beside the basic strikes you know I know like windmill strike or whatever for the watcher but plus three damage on strikes unless you are doing a, an ironclad strike deck perfect strike deck nah man like this is just not it it's it's a free upgrade to your strikes but you're gonna be removing those anyway unless you're really, really going for that perfected strike deck. And in that case, yeah, it'll be great. But most of the time, you're looking to remove strikes. Unless you're the watcher, you're moving defense. It's a uh, not a great relic, to be honest. Next up, we have Sun Dial, which provides two energy every three times you shuffle your deck. I'm gonna put that at the very bottom of B tier. I think this is obviously going to be great if you've got an infinite going or something that's near infinite. This can really make that infinite happen. But it also requires small decks. It requires you to shuffle quite often, so you need to have a lot of cycle or a draw. And if you're not running an infinite deck, there's nothing wrong with getting plus two energy, but it's also just not going to win the run for you. Um, it is nice that these numbers persist from combat to combat, so if you're really interested in working it, like you might work a, a pen nib or something like that, like you might work an ink bottle to get the draw set up at the end of a fight to go off turn one in the next fight, you know, you can do that with Sundial and it'll give you a little bit of energy turn one, but just not something that I feel like is going to really win a run unless you're aiming for one of those super small infinite decks. And this can be that last little piece that kind of gives you just enough energy to do it. Um, not a bad relic at all. You're not going to be mad to see it, but I think most of my decks end up being large enough that they don't really care about this so it is what it is next up we have one of the defect exclusive relics symbiotic virus which starts you off combat with one free channeled dark orb i'm gonna put that in d i absolutely love dark orbs on the defect i think they're great especially if you can you know get a recursion in there keep it coming back if you can get a dual cast on it, you really got to let them cook though. So with three slots, if you've already got, you know, one frost orb or one lightning orb from your starter relic, this is going to be your second. You've only got one more free orb slot. You cast a couple more orbs. You're looking at maybe a 12 each or 12 damage maybe 18 damage might be all right but i don't think this is something you want to have to start off with on the the defect just because you're probably playing a lot of 
cards that generate orbs and they're not gonna let that orb sit and get very big and maybe early on in a run when enemies don't have a lot of HP it can be great but when you're looking at 300 plus HP in Act 3 getting you know 12 damage out of a dark orb kind of like okay well thanks I guess it's just a little bit of extra damage that falls off over the course of a run next up we have the tear drop locket the watcher exclusive which starts you off in calm every combat that is the bottom of s tier for me getting into calm just so you can get back out of it as quickly as possible is one of your number one priorities as the watcher and anything that helps you get into calm so you can get out of it again is very very valuable another thing that will help those watcher infinites get started more quickly sometimes that first turn can be a little sketch depending on the size of your deck and how it's constructed and if you've got multiple sources of calm or not this can really just make it easier to get that infinite watcher deck going next up is the courier which offers a 20 percent discount at the merchant but much 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 more importantly it gives the merchant the ability to restock their supplies as you buy so i'm going to throw this right next to the bottled tornado at the top of a tier i think that shops are incredibly valuable and this makes them even better it makes stuff cheaper and it allows you to buy more obviously if your your deck is already full if you don't have a lot of gold you know whatever but generally speaking when you pick up the rat you're thinking hey how many shops can i get to and how much gold can I get? How many combats can I take? And that really, really, really can add a lot of value to your deck. Next up, we have Toxic Egg. And that's going to go right in the middle of S tier. This is the best egg in the game. I've said that skills are the best set of cards. The most varied kind of card is far as what they do and what function they have so getting upgraded skills is incredibly valuable this can be valuable even late game you know you pick up a toxic egg in act three that may encourage you to take more skills that you may not have wanted if they weren't upgraded there are a lot of great skill upgrades so even late into an act, this can be super, super valuable because it can be just that little push over the edge, that upgraded skill that maybe you wouldn't have taken unupgraded now becomes much easier to take because of the value that Toxic Egg provides and the value of skill cards inherently. Next up is White Beast Statue, which gives you one guaranteed potion every combat. That's going right up there with Toxic Egg. I've said it in a lot of videos, but I absolutely love potions. They can be an emergency button that gets you out of a really bad situation. Or they can be something that, you know, you use with pre-planning. You say, I want to hold on to this potion until this fight. And then that's going to make this really challenging fight super easy. Now, banking potions might be a little bit harder with this. If you've got a full potion belt, maybe you're playing high ascension, and you've only got two slots. It does lose a little bit of a value. You are very much incentivized to continue using potions and just use potions all the time, no matter what. Maybe you sit on a fairy in a bottle just in case, but most of the time those potions that you might want to hold on to for the boss fight you know you want a fear potion for vulnerability or you want a, a strength potion to make those attacks hit harder whatever it is like 
most of the times those potions that have a lot of value that you do want to hold on to, this will really push you to use. But I think that also adds to the fun and makes runs a lot more interesting because you get to use something that is normally quite a limited resource. Maybe you only use a couple potions and act because you're banking them for later. Then you get this, you're like, wow, I can use potions all the time now. I don't have to worry about saving this potion because I have a very, very good chance if I just keep taking combats, I'll get it again. How many times have you uh, used a block potion in a fight and then you get a reward at the end of the combat and it's another block potion, right? So just keep using those potions and you'll find something good eventually. All right, finally, I don't know how I skipped over this one. I guess I just missed it in my notes, but Mummified Hand, right up to the top of A tier. I think that this is one of those relics that you're always, always excited to see, even if you don't have a necessarily super power heavy deck, just because even with one or two powers, you might be able to find a way to use that power to make one of your really expensive, powerful cards in your win condition free. And it's a really great bonus. You're gonna be getting it every single combat. And if you get it early or in the middle of a run, it really, really incentivizes you to take more powers. And it's just a lot of fun. You know, even if it's not a defect crazy power deck, but building a, an ironclad corruption with Feel No Pain and Dark Embrace and all that stuff, you know. Power decks just tend to be really, really fun to play. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we're here for? Having fun. Any kind of relic that is fun and powerful and allows you to play quite strategically, you know, holding on to a power because you wanna make something zero cost later. Or, you know, it changes the order that you play your cards in because you're like, hey, I really want to make this Meteor Strike zero cost. But I got a, five cards in my hand right now and it's it could be anything. So I want to play a couple attacks or skills first, then my power. So my mummified hand has a higher chance of hitting that Meteor Strike. And it's a golden relic as far as I'm concerned because it's got all the best things powerful fun and strategic so that is the uncommon tier uncommon relic tier list for me let me know what you think let me know if i got anything totally wrong you know maybe i'm just really bad at the silent and i don't know what i'm doing with paper cream maybe i'm really bad at the ironclad and i don't know what i'm doing with self-forming clay you know what have you uh, there was one other thing. I posted the tier list of the common relics to Reddit. And, you know, people pointed out that I had put the Burning Blood for Ironclad in the B tier. But I had put the relic that heals you when you use potions. Why am I not thinking of it right now? Oh my god, I'm totally blanking. Anyway, they're saying you only get 5 HP when you heal with potions. But you get 6 HP every single combat, no matter what, with Ironclad. And that's that's very, very true. But the thing about that is that... Like I said at the beginning of the video, it's not necessarily a flat... How powerful is it? But it's more of like a, you know, for my play style, what do I think is fun? What do I enjoy getting? And one of the things that plays into that is the distinction between is this something I can strategically use or is it just like a passive thing that just happens? So the burning blood, something that just happens, very, very useful, can provide great amount of healing over the course of a run, but not something that you really play around. Man, it's really bothering me what that relic is that I'm forgetting now. Toy Ornithopter. That's the one. All right. That's the one that heals when you use relics. So yeah, they said 
Burning Blood gives you more than Toy Ornithopter. Well, yes, I agree. But I like the fact that I can trigger the healing when I like. And that when you have Burning Blood, it's just at the end of combat, okay. But perhaps you finished a combat with full HP and it doesn't give you anything. I think even though it only heals you 5 HP when you use a potion, you know, you can choose to use that when you actually get value from that 5 HP. Maybe that 5 HP is what keeps you alive and allows you to play another turn. You know, 6 HP at the end of a fight that you end at full health doesn't matter. So, Burning Blood is great, does offer lots of good healing, but Toy Ornithopter was just something I thought was fun because I use it. So when you're watching this, if you see something that might strike you as a little weird, that is one thing to consider, is that this is not necessarily a 100% objective, the most best, powerfulest relics ever, but it's just something that I like to have fun with. I get a big kick out of when I see it in a reward screen. And that's fun to play with. You know, I can strategize with it. I can use it. It's not just a passive bonus necessarily. And I am, like I said, trying to keep this kind of spread out. I think Slay the Spire actually has a ton of great relics. And you can see a lot of other tier lists where the A tier is just absolutely full of junk not junk but you know full of stuff because there's so many good relics which is kind of why i wanted to split this into different tiers or different sets of tiers for the you know common uncommon blah 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 to make it a little bit easier to digest and then also try to spread it out a little bit more trying to be a little bit more varied with the range so that it's just not just A, A, A over and over again. Lots of these relics can be A tier in the right circumstance. But generally speaking, this is how I feel about what is going to be the most fun, the most powerful, the most useful across the widest variety of decks for all characters. Things that are only going to be very useful in specific situations or things that are only really useful for a particular character, aside from, of course, the exclusives, they're just not going to rank as highly because they're not something that you're always going to be happy to see. But something like Mummified Hand, Toxic Egg, Eternal Feather, I mean, it doesn't matter who you're playing, what kind of deck you're playing, those are just fantastic relics that you always love to see. So, thanks for sticking around to the end. That's another Tips and Tricks Tuesday for Ruckus Gaming. I'll be coming out with another tier list soon for those rare relics. Tune in Saturday for some fun content. Let's do another Let's Play. Let's do another challenge. I'm not sure what exactly is up on the docket, but I've already got something recorded. And drop a like, comment, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. Thanks again for watching Ruckus Gaming.